We're going to be in Proverbs tonight. Proverbs chapter 27. Good to see you. Good to see the bells back. We've got some folks out with sickness and some folks, other folks traveling. I know um, the Johnsons are gone this for a couple of days, so you have people coming and going, but it's good to see folks back, and I'm glad when people can get away and get a rest. And We're going to be reading just one verse as we start, but we'll look at some other verses. Um, we're going to read verse 17. I invite you to stand with us for the reading of the scripture tonight. Very important subject to me, and that is the matter of our um, associations, our companions, our friends. You know, it's one thing to be acquainted with somebody, maybe somebody you work with, somebody that you're a neighbor to, and you're trying to reach them with the gospel, and you're trying to engage them in conversations. But the really, the closer you get to someone, uh, different different biblical principles apply. And so we're going to talk some about friendships uh, tonight and a couple of lessons in the future, but it's a good place to start. Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And tonight's lesson really will be kind of an introduction to the subject of friendships. And, it, you know, there are some, so there's some subjects, very practical issues in life, that, you know, you try to find biblical principles that apply to it, you know, things because we're to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But this is a subject that there's just a lot of material devoted particular to that subject. It's relevant for all of us. It's, it's particularly important for our children to understand the importance of their friendships. And it's important for parents to understand as they establish guidelines uh, for their children. I know when I, I can remember when I was a teenager that my mother uh, had expressed concern about some of my peop the people I hung around with. She was afraid that I was gonna contaminate them. No, she was really afraid they were gonna, we connect, the truth is we, didn't, we weren't good for each other. So um, this is a real critical topic. So let's pray and ask for God's help. Lord, thank you again that we can study your word we pray that you would uh, just help, help us, Lord, to receive it as it is, the very Word of God, and to apply it with, with eager, receptive hearts to our life. I pray for all of us. Lord, we all know people, probably, that, uh, the, that being associated with the right kind of companions has helped them immensely. We also know people who being associated with the wrong kind of companions have suffered because of it. So we pray that you'd help us tonight. All be learners, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this is, like I said, just a starting point. Friendships are critically important. Iron sharpens iron. It's an object lesson, you know, that uh, two pieces of iron together can improve the edge at least of one of them, if not both of them, but one of them for certain. In the same way, friends can sharpen each other. It says in verse 17 there, as iron, sharp, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So the right kind of friend can make us better. I, I couldn't emphasize that too much. The right kind of friend can make us sharper. It can improve us. And that's really one of the goals of friendship, as we'll see going on. So let's just begin with this idea that, that having friends, just having friends, is, is biblical. You know, sometimes I, I kid um, our, our grandkids, rarely, but sometimes I do. Like yesterday, I was kidding Alana because she brought somebody to my office and called her her friend. And I said, Alana, I'm so proud of you. I never thought you'd have a friend. But the truth is, biblically... <laughs> Isn't that terrible? I get it from her grandmother. <laughs> it's biblical to have friends, and the Bible who tells us about friends tells us the kinds of friends and the purpose of friends and the danger of the wrong kind of friend. As a matter of fact, in the book of Exodus, uh, it says that 
God would speak to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. He likened the relationship that he had with Moses to a friendship. Three times in the Bible, it says that Abraham was a friend of God. So friendships are biblical. And God, so God has friends, aren't you glad? And God communicates with his friends. He speaks like he would to, to a friend. Go with me if you would. We're going to come back to Proverbs for the majority of our evening. But go with me if you would please to the Gospel of John. Where Jesus is giving some of his final words to his disciples before going to the cross. And we're going to look in John chapter 15 and just read a few verses. John chapter 15 and verse 12, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You love others in the same way that I love you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So I think that's important, really, an important sort of a side note to think that Jesus refers to his disciples as friends. God communicates with people as friends. And so friendship is a part of life. Now, I know that um, some of us are more um, introverted than others. Some of us are, are, you know, don't really like a lot of uh, exchange with other people. And maybe people may even think that friendship is, is just too risky or unnecessary. But a friend is important. A friend is someone that's dear to you. And um, matter of fact, when God made the first man, what did God say about that man before he made the woman? It's not good that man should be alone. So God made us have companionship. So there's, that's a part of life. That's a part of the way God made us. And, uh, and he intends for us to be in relationships that improve us, that make us better, sharpen us. And I hope that you can think in your life of someone, maybe it's your, someone in your family, maybe your spouse, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe just a friend that you've met, that someone that their friendship has made you a stronger Christian. It's made you a better person because that's what friendships should do. Friendships, the biblical friendships that God gives us direction about should make us better. It should improve us. As iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. So being around those people should help you. And God, God intends for us to be better because of our relationships. And that's true in our, in our marriages. That's true in our families. It's true in our friendships. It's true in the church family. It ought to be true of us. We're back in Proverbs chapter 27 and there are many places in the Bible that it talks about friendships in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But this could almost be called the friendship chapter. Because I just want to read the verses in this one chapter that have to do with friendships. Look in verse 6, Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. We'll address that later. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Proverbs 27 and verse 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so does the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. In, in verse 10, thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Verse 14, he that blesseth his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. And then we're back to where we began in verse 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So I'm just, just beginning by just emphasizing the fact that having friends is biblical. The Bible speaks about it. 
And uh, we, we, we ought to be thankful, for, I'm thankful, for the friendship relationships that we have. I'm glad that my wife is indeed my best friend. And uh, I think that that's a blessing, that you have family members. Our children are truly our friends. Those things, those are blessings of life. Many friends, friends we have in our church, people that we have much in common with, people we love to serve together with, people we fellowship with. And so what would God want us to think about when we think about friends? I'm just going to throw these out here. These are some things we're going to look at. First of all, we ought to consider what we're to look for in a friend. What kind of friend would be beneficial? What kind of friend would meet God's approval? And if we have friends, what is our relationship to those friends? What are our obligations and what kind of friends should we avoid? I said this earlier, I'll just say it again. As parents, we ought to especially be concerned about this, about who our children's friends are. Uh, it's, a, it's a big part of life. It's a, it's a big part of adolescence. It's a big part of childhood that we help them in the selection of the right kind of friends. Because as we're going to see in a moment ago, friends will indeed influence us. They may influence us to be better. They could influence us to make unwise decisions. And so we want God's wisdom. We want when our children to avoid pitfalls of unhealthy friendships. And if you would think, I don't think anybody here would assume this, but if you were to think that somehow your children will not be influenced by their friends, you're not just being unwise, you're contradicting the Bible. Because the Bible is very clear about this. And I can speak from personal experience, having the wrong friends in my life uh, help contribute to me making some very foolish decisions, things that I will regret my entire life. And I'm not blaming it on my friends, but I know this, if I'd have been around a different group of friends, they may not have happened. And if they would have been around a different group of friends other than me, they might not, might not have gotten into the mischief they got into. So, so having friends is biblical, but we want to look at it the Bible way. Now here's, here's a part of my concern tonight as we think about this, and that is that we can differentiate between what we kind of tend to look for in friendships and what God says about friendships. Because like so many things in life, God's, God's goals, God's objectives, God's plans are different, sometimes radically different than what ours are. You know, and those of us who can remember what it was like before we were saved can say that when we made friends, when we engaged in friendship, and I had a couple of friends uh, for the majority of my junior high, senior high life, so these were two close, close friends. When we really had friends like that, we weren't looking for how they could make us better. We had another objective. We had other opinions. We, had, we were looking for other things. And so just because you think you know what you need in a friend, you ought to re-examine that based on what the Bible says. And so what do we naturally, when I say naturally, I'm talking about our natural inclination, our human nature. What do we look for in friends? We look for common interests, right? We look for common values, maybe. We look for people to agree with us. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been well said that you really never know how, how, where you stand with a person until you disagree with them. We, we mainly look for friends that agree with us. I think people like to have friends that make them feel better. You say, I, this person, I like this person, it makes me feel better. We want people to listen to us. We like friends who will listen to us. We like friends who will sympathize with us. Nothing wrong with those things to a degree. But just because a person goes along with us doesn't mean they're a good friend. Just because a person does not tell us, don't go there, doesn't mean that they're not a good friend. As a matter of fact, the best friend you have may be the one that tries to stop you from doing things you really want to do. You believe that? Uh, there's a, there's a, a classic example of this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to look at it. It's in 2 Samuel, and some of you know the story, and I could just kind of tell it without looking at it. But in 2 Samuel chapter 13... One of David's sons, King David's son's name was Amnon, 
And Amnon is notorious for having the wrong friend at a critical time in his life. And it tells us in verses 1 and 2 that Amnon, um, not Ab, Absalom, it says, let's just read verse 1. It came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So, so Amnon uh, was attracted to his half-sister, and, and everything about that was wrong. It, morally wrong, against God's law. Uh, but it tells us in verse uh, 3 that Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. And Jonadab was a, the Bible says in verse 3, a very subtle man. And so here you have Amnon who is desiring a relationship with his half-sister that was immoral and against God's law. But Amnon has this friend, Jonadab. I'm glad it tells us it was his friend. It was his friend. And, and Jonadab knows what Amnon is about. He knows what he's thinking about. He's sick, lovesick, the Bible says. And so, so what? Think about this. Here's Amnon desiring to make a decision. Now think about this. That could, could and did, could and would bring great heartache and disaster to a lot of people. Amnon wants to do this, but Amnon's got a friend. Now, what should that friend, I ought to ask some of these teenagers to come up here and we'll take a little quiz, but I'm not going to do it. So what should Amnon's friend, Jonadab, had said to Amnon? He should have said, you're out of your mind. This is not right. You need to stop what you're doing. Stop what you're thinking. You need, you, you need to get your head on straight. That's what that's what Jonadab, his friend, should have said to him. What would you do as a teenager? If you saw your friend and knew your friend was about to do something that was wrong, something that was against God's word, something that could bring shame on their life, shame on their family, disgrace, and you're their friend, what would you say to that person? And I would hope that you would, you would try, grab them and try to shake some sense into their head. Don't go there. Don't do that. You'll, you'll be ashamed. You'll be embarrassed. You'll regret it. But Jonadab was a very subtle man. And you know what Jonadab did? He actually created a scenario to help his friend Amnon do something that was wrong. The point being, just because your friend goes along with you, doesn't mean they're a good friend. Just because a friend will agree with what you're saying doesn't make them a good friend. And the point being, a lot of times that's what people are looking for in friends. In, or, in other words, in order for you to be my friend, you've got to always go along with me. If you're going to be my friend, you've got to agree with me. If you're going to be my friend, you can't cross me. Because probably people actually break up friendships because someone has the courage and the conviction to say that is wrong. You know, I think, I think we underestimate sometimes the, the harm that's done by our silence when we just won't say, you need to stop doing that. We just, we're, well, I'm their friend. I don't want to hurt their feeling. I'm their friend. There's something more important than our feelings. And that is what does God want. And so I, I, I began all this by just talking about the fact that what are we looking for in friendship? Are we just looking for people who agree with us? Are we just looking for people who make us feel good? You know, friendships can be painful sometimes. They can cause emotional pain. And when you lose friends, it can. I was, I was just noticing today the number of times in the Proverbs where it talks about how people will be your friend as long as you have something they want. Just listen to these three examples. All in Proverbs. The rich hath many friends. Here's another one. Wealth maketh many friends. 
Here's another one. Every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. I mean, if you start walking down the road handing out $1,000 bills, you're going to have a lot of friends. Right? But is that a real friend? The answer is no. Proverbs, Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loveth at all times. A friend doesn't just love you when you give them what they want. A friend doesn't just love you when they agree with you. So, so having said this, I said this is going to kind of be just an introduction to this message. This is the greatest handbook there is on friendships. What does the Bible say? And one of the things it tells us, let's go to Proverbs chapter 13. We're going to look at a couple other passages here. One of the things it tells us is that friends will influence us. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. It didn't say they might be wise, they could be wise, they shall be wise. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So friendships are going to influence us. It's going to, it'll rub off on us. Some more than others probably, no doubt. But so, so we ought to, if, if you're walking with wise men, you're going to wise, be wise. So parents should ask themselves this question. Are, my, are the, children, the people my children are friends with, the children that they're hanging out with, are what I could consider those to be wise? Now keep in mind, we may be talking about teenagers, so we're not sure how much wisdom to expect from a teenager, but he that walketh with wise men shall, shall be wise. And, and a, as a teenager, I would have questioned my mother's opinion and judgment on this subject every time, I'm sure, because she didn't really like some of my friends. And I just felt like she was wrong and feeling that way. But you know what? After the fact, I realized she was a lot wiser than I gave her credit for. Walking with wise men will cause us to become wise. But a companion of fools will be destroyed. If, you're, if your friends are foolish, think about this. And you ought to ask yourself this. Are, are the friends that I like, would I consider them wise according to God's standard? Or would I consider them to be living foolishly? If they're prideful, if they're selfish, if they're rebellious toward their parents, a companion of fools will be destroyed. Um, if, you, if your child has a close friend, your children, for instance, that use profanity, that, that are rebellious toward their parents, do you think that's going to affect them? If they, if they have friends that, that excuse worldly music, do you think that's going to affect your children? If you, if you think it's not going to affect your children, you're mistaken. Amen. You're mistaken. And this is, this is really sounds like a, I'm being kind of cynical or critical, but I, I, I want to make a point. A parent... A parent that would be go, that would overlook this and ignore this because they don't want their children to be upset with them just shows the weakness of a parent. God didn't call us to give our children what they want. God called us to provide for our children what they need. And if parents don't have the backbone to say, no, you can't be hanging around that person. You can't, if they're going to talk like this, if they're going to do that, you're not going to be their friend. And it's not based on our opinion. It's based on God's opinion. A companion of fools will be destroyed. Look in Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 24. This is, a, this is a verse, chapter 22, uh, 24, verse 24, is a verse that I've brought up many times in premarital counseling. Notice what it says. 
Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go. The Bible warns us about having close relationships with people who's, who don't have any character. Who are out of control. And notice what verse 25 says. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Again, what it tells us is friendships will influence us. Don't make a friendship with an angry man. You're going to learn his ways. You'll become like him. It really is true that we, we become like those we associate with. So we have to be careful about making these, these friendships with people without character, people who are negative, people who are complainers, people who are lustful, because we tend to become like those we associate with. A person could say, well, you know, but Jesus was a friend of sinners. And he was, right? That's what they called him, a friend of sinners. But Jesus wasn't a friend of sinners to enjoy what sinners had to offer. Jesus was a friend of sinners to bring them out of their sin. So what should we look for in friendships? And we're going to kind of just make this our closing thought tonight. What should we look for in friendships? We ought to look for friendships that make us better. We ought to look for friendships. Young person, you ought to look for friendships that challenge you to be a better Christian. That encourage you spiritually. Those are the kind of friendships that we need. Friends, friends that make us better. I, I want to. I've said something earlier, and I want to clarify this. There's a difference in making you feel better and making you better. A friend that just always tries to make you feel better may not necessarily make you better. And I, I think we ought to empathize with people and sympathize with people. But there's a difference. So, so that's what. Back to our where we started off in in Proverbs, uh, chapter 27. That's. Iron sharpeneth iron, in verse 17, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. Being around the right kind of people should help us. Make us sharper. You know, a dull knife is still a knife, but it's not as effective. And being around the wrong associations can make us dull. I don't mean like dull, like boring. I mean dull, like not effective, not be able to fulfill our purpose. Um, you're in Proverbs. Go to the right just a little bit to the book of Ecclesiastes. And there's a passage here in Ecclesiastes 10 I've preached from a few times over the years. Just one verse. Ecclesiastes 10, 10. Very practical lesson about chopping wood. About the axe. Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10. If, the, if the iron be blunt, it's not sharp. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, sharpen the edge with a whetstone or a wet rock. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to rex. In other words, a dull knife needs to be sharpened. And, and, you know, if a, person would, if a person were to say, you know, I really need to do something to improve my spiritual walk. Well, there are a number of things you can do. Number one, we could spend time going over our life and what we've been doing, confessing our sins, repenting to God, asking for God's forgiveness. Another thing we do is spend more time in God's word. But another thing we do is be around, around people who will encourage us spiritually. I think one of the most powerful Influence in a young person's life can be someone their age who loves the Lord and is serious about their spiritual growth. In some ways, and it's sometimes, a friend, an associate, a, a, someone your age can have more influence on you even than I can have on you. Because you see that they're going through, going through what you go through. They're living life as a teenager, living life as a child, and yet they're looking to God. They don't have a bad attitude. They're not rebellious. They're not worldly. That has a powerful influence. We ought to be around friends who make us better, and that's one thing that will improve us is the right kind of companions. In Proverbs 27, 
Get back there if you would, please. Proverbs 27. There's a couple of verses in this chapter that speak to that. And I think it'd be a good place to wrap this up. Look in verse 6. Proverbs 27, 6. 25, yeah, 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, one could read that and think, well, what does that mean, the wounds of a friend? Could that mean maybe your friend hurt your feelings or your friend, you know, knocked you off your bicycle? I mean, what does that mean, the wounds of a friend? Fade for the wound. But look at the verse previous to it, and I think it explains that. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A true friend will even rebuke you. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, a true friend will tell you what is best, even if it's not what you want to hear. Now think with me tonight, and I think this is maybe more uh, applicable tonight to young people than it is those of us who are adults, especially older adults, but it could be, but it's true for all of us. But just ask yourself this young person, what if my friend, and maybe that's, this is where you live, I hope it is, that you have a friend, and if you get a bad attitude, or if you say something you shouldn't say, or you start pondering something that's not biblical, that your friend will rebuke you for that. That's what it says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's the kind of friend we need. By the way, that's, I talk about Jesus' friendship. That's the way Jesus is. Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, but that just that doesn't mean he's just always saying, you know, things don't matter, go ahead. I know, I know it's against the rules, but go ahead and do it. That's not the kind of friend he is. He rebukes us when we're wrong. He shows us. He speaks to us clearly from his word when we're wrong and rebukes us. And we need that. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Carnal people only want people around them that agree with them because they're not really spiritually minded people. And we ought to be willing to take rebuke. Having someone, it's a valuable thing to have somebody who loves you enough to tell you what you need to hear. And, and, and I always think about this when I'm thinking about the matter of reproof and rebuke and correction and how God works in our life. But you know, you know who the Bible says in Proverbs 1 refuses instruction? It's a fool. Fools despise instruction. You know what I was when I was a teenager? I was a fool. I was foolish. I didn't like... The teacher's telling me what to do. I didn't like my mama telling me what to do. I didn't like law enforcement telling me what to do. I just didn't, you know, because I was a fool. It wasn't because I was, it wasn't because I was brave or courageous or smart. It was because I was a fool. Fools despise instruction. And so we need to, even though our flesh doesn't like to be told you're wrong, we need to be willing to listen to parents, to listen to those in authority, to recognize that God put them in our life for a purpose. And so a very important question would be, how do I respond, how do I take it when someone shows me a better way? And we ought to say thank you for showing me that. Amen. That's a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of that we're, we're wanting God's best. And the reality is, as Christians... We ought to be encouraging one another. You know, Proverbs, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says we're to provoke one another to love and good works. That's, that's a, a straightforward ad, admonition, a command from the Word of God. Provoke one another. That means we as Christians, especially in, in the church body, and that's the, that's the very passage in Hebrews 10 where it says, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the day, more as you see the day approaching. He said we're to provoke each other to love and good works. We ought to challenge each other to serve the Lord. We ought to challenge each other to do right. Uh, something came up in a conversation that I was in at another church recently um, about this very subject. And 
about whether we as Christians should be able to go to other Christians and say, look, could I, could I challenge you to think about this? Could I encourage you to think about this? Maybe this is something you ever never really thought about. That's, now, if we don't really know them, if we're not friends with them, then it may not be welcome. But, if, but there are people in this room, many people in this room, if they were to come to me and say, look, I've got something I'd like for you to think about or pray about, I ought to be willing to hear that. Because I ought to believe they're not just doing that to pick a fight or they're not doing that just to be pushy. They're doing it because they care about what's right. And if we put up a wall, every time somebody tries to show us a better way, if we put up a wall, then we're really not open. And that's being foolish, really. Despising instruction. This is what Christians ought to do for each other. And we ought to challenge each other to be better. Now, like any, anything from the Bible... We have to decide what we're going to do with it. God doesn't force things on us, but he gives it to us in a plan. He lays it out in the Bible. He said, There's, here's some practical wisdom that we can use in our life, but we have to decide what we're going to do with it. Wouldn't it be wonderful, though? Young people in here that are 8, 10, 12 years old and older, what if we don't, young people say, you know, I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to put that to work in my life. I want to, I want to try to have the kind of friends that will help me be a better Christian. That's not being judgmental. It's not being a Pharisee. It's not being prideful. It's trying to live by the Bible. It's trying to live by the Bible. We ought to, we ought to say, Lord, how can I use this in my life? And you ought to ask yourself tonight, just evaluate. Do a little inventory right now of some of your friends. Just think about it. Some of the friends you have, even as adults, the friends we have. Are these friends helping me love the Lord more? Serve the Lord more? Be a better Christian? There, I guarantee you there are people here, I'm not the only one that feels this way, I'm certain, who can think back on friendships that really caused you, cost you dearly. Right? And it happens. It happens. We want, we're going we're to have a couple more lessons on this subject but I wanted to begin tonight just by talking about the, the value of friendships, how important it is, and how important it is for us as parents to be concerned about that in our children's life, how important it is for young people to make those decisions on their own as they grow older. It's always a very um, unwise move to say, well, you know, that may, that may all be true, but I don't think it'll be that tr true in my life. If it's God's word, it's going to be true. Amen. It is true. Amen. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Before I pray tonight with our heads bowed, would you would you just pray about this? Say, Lord, I want to I want to take these principles to heart. I want to be cautious about my friendships, my relationships. Yes, we have acquaintances, people that we want to influence with the gospel, but those aren't our close, close friends. If they're not saved, if they're not, you know, trying to live for the Lord, we want the right kind of friends, friends that would help us be better. If you see in your own life uh, this reluctance to take counsel or reluctance to uh, receive instruction, if you see that you have to say, Lord, I want to I fix this. I, want, I don't want to be a fool. I want to fix this.